In this video, the formularies of the Anglican Church that I'll be using as a source for Anglican doctrine are the 39 Articles of Religion, the Book of Common Prayer, which I'll just call the BCP, and the Books of Homilies. All of those are linked in the description below for you to read yourselves. And also, I won't be taking this as a source for the Anglican formularies, but since Thomas Cranmer wrote the Book of Common Prayer and most of the Thonana articles, I will also be referring to his book, A Defense of the True and Catholic Doctrine of the Sacrament of the Body and Blood of Our Savior Christ. That's the name of the book. This is Thomas Cranmer's explanation of all of his Eucharistic beliefs. I think it's a very important source for understanding the language that he has in the Book of Common Prayer for us. Now, there are several things to discuss in this video. We're going to first go through through the more basic things that we don't have to spend much time on. Then near the end of the video, we're going to get to the bigger and more complex issues and spend much more time on those. So the first thing that's sort of distinctive about the Anglican practice of the Eucharist is that Anglicans practice the Eucharist liturgically. We do it with a set form that prescribes what the priest says and what the congregation says in response. So that usually on a Sunday in an Anglican church, our liturgy, our service of the Eucharist is very similar. Now, the reason we do this is first and foremost because it's a tradition that has been around since the beginning of Christianity. The church has always practiced the Eucharist liturgically. But also the, the reason why the church has always done that is essentially because liturgy preserves the truth about what we're saying the Eucharist is and does, but also preserves the truth of the gospel message itself, which should always be coming through that Eucharistic liturgy really clearly. So even if your priest has some dodgy theology, the liturgy is ensuring that the people there are getting that gospel message loud and clear. And as we'll see later, the Eucharist is also one of the ways in which God signs and seals and pledges his promises to us. So it's very important that the Eucharistic ceremony has precise and clear language to ensure that those promises are being clearly expressed and explained to the congregation. Now, Anglicans, like all Christians, believe that the Eucharist represents the unity of the church, because as St. Paul says, we who are many are one body, for we all break the one bread. The point is, when you take the Eucharist, it's not an individualistic matter. It's not about you as an isolated, atomized individual feeding on Christ, but you are doing it as one part of his corporate body. Jesus says in John 6, whoever eats his flesh and drinks his blood abides in him and he abides in them. And St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians that the, the cup that we share is a participation in the blood of Christ. So we're not doing this individually. If you are abiding in Christ when you eat the bread that symbolizes his body, then you would, you are abiding in his corporate body, the church. So that's a crucial aspect of, I think, all denominations' understanding of the Eucharist, and it's definitely something that Anglicans believe about it as well. There's not really much else to say about that that for Anglicans is distinctive from other denominations. Anglicans also believe that the Eucharist is our ultimate and supreme act of worship. And as such, we believe the Eucharist should be celebrated as often as possible. And most Anglican churches around the world will actually celebrate the Eucharist every Sunday. Now, the reason why we believe the Eucharist is our ultimate act of worship is because, as St. Paul says, as often as we take the Eucharist, we proclaim the Lord's death. What that means is the Eucharist is proclaiming to the Father the glorious sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was the ultimate act of worship in the entire history of the cosmos, when he offered up his own life and his own body. And he, of course, is the Son of God, the Logos that created all things. When he offered up his supremely, ultimately, um, just unbelievably powerful body and life to the Father, that was the ultimate act of worship on behalf of the universe. When we're celebrating the Eucharist, we're proclaiming that sacrificial death. Essentially, what we're saying to God is, God, there is nothing I can offer you. There is nothing I can give you that is that can even compare to what your son Jesus offered you on the cross. So all I can do is just hold up the memory 
of that act before you. That's why it's our ultimate act of worship. And in a way, then, all our worship is, in a sense, incomplete without the Eucharist. That's not to say that we can't worship without the Eucharist. I think we can and should. I think we should be worshiping God every minute of every day. And of course, we're not always doing that with the Eucharist. But the point is the Eucharist completes our worship because the Eucharist is when we say, yes, Lord, I can worship you in my life and I do worship you in my life, but it doesn't compare to what your son did. And that's why we represent it through the Eucharist. Okay, so that covers the more basic elements of what we believe about the Eucharist. Now we're going to look at some of the more complex issues, starting off with the idea of sacrifice. Anglicans, unlike Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox, do not believe that the Eucharist is a sacrifice. Article 31 of the Articles of Religion says, The offering once made by Christ on the cross is that perfect redemption, propitiation, and satisfaction for all the sins of the whole world, both original and actual. And there is none other satisfaction for sin but that alone. Wherefore, the sacrifices of the Eucharist, in which it was commonly said that the priest did offer Christ for the living and the dead to have remission of pain or guilt, were blasphemous fables and dangerous deceits. In the medieval church, there was an understanding that in the Eucharist, the priest was representing the sacrifice of Christ to the Father, and that actually made it a sacrifice. So Jesus had his one sacrifice on the cross, they affirmed that, but that sacrifice needed to be perpetually represented to the Father and reapplied to the congregation. So when the congregation, when members of the of the church fall into sin, they fall back into a state of sin, they lose their justification and they need to regain it. Christ's sacrifice needs to be reapplied to them, and the Eucharist was one way that that happened because it represented Christ's sacrifice, which made the Eucharist itself a sacrifice. Article 31 is completely denying that view. The reason we deny that view is because Anglicans believe, as all our formularies make very clear, in salvation by faith alone and justification by faith alone. We do not believe that we can do or perform a work that can justify us or increase our justification. We are justified by our faith only. Purely because of our trust in the efficacy of Christ's one sacrifice, we have been made justified. That justification cannot decrease or increase. When we fall into sin, we're still justified so long as we perpetually have faith and a repentant heart. Okay, and so there's no sense that when you take the Eucharist, your justification is increasing before the fire that you've been made more righteous, or certainly no sense in which when you sin, you lose your justification and have to gain it back by doing something like taking the Eucharist. Now, also in the 39 articles, we have this idea of predestination coming through in article 17. The idea is that for God's chosen elect, they will continue perpetually to have faith in Jesus Christ throughout their lives. They will continually and perpetually have a repentant heart all the days of their life, and that those things are a gift that God has gratuitously given them. What that means is God holds you in his unconditional love, in the embrace of his unconditional love all the days of your life, and therefore your justification is something that perpetually you are being held in. You cannot lose it, you cannot increase it, it cannot decrease from you. And so there's no sense then that the Eucharist is some sort of sacrifice that affects your righteousness before God. It doesn't. What affects your righteousness before God was a sacrifice that Jesus Christ offered, and your faith and trust in that sacrifice efficacy. The Eucharist is a symbol and remembrance of Christ's sacrifice, but it's not a reapplication of it. God has already been appeased by Christ's sacrifice. He doesn't need to be appeased again. God knows that you're going to fall into sin because we have total depravity in our nature. God is under no illusions about the fact that you are going to continue to sin. So his, his appeasement and his love for you doesn't go up and down, up and down. It's here one minute, gone the next. It's unconditional because of your justification and because of your election. 
However, there is an idea that the Eucharist reaffirms the promises that has been made by God to you about your salvation. But that doesn't mean it's a reapplication of those promises. The promises aren't taken away and given back. They're simply reaffirmed, but they were always true. We're going to get to that later when we look at how the Eucharist is a sacrament. However, in the liturgy of the BCP, it does call the Eucharist a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And in Thomas Cranmer's defense of the true doctrine, he says that the Eucharist is a sacrifice which doth not reconcile us to God, but is made of them that be already reconciled by Christ to testify our duties unto God and to show ourselves thankful unto him. In it, we declare that we remembereth what benefit we hath received by the death of Christ and testify that we are members of of Christ's body. Essentially then in the Eucharist we are turning our faith and trust in Christ into sacrificial praise. We are essentially holding up our faith before the Father as a sacrifice and saying, look Father, I am thankful for what Christ did for me and I trust in what he did for me. That's how it's a sacrifice of praise. But there's also a sense that because in the Eucharist we are being united to Christ's body and blood, we are also dedicating our entire lives to God as a sacrifice, which is why in the BCP's liturgy we say, Here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and lively sacrifice unto thee. Now, because Anglicans don't think that the Eucharist is a propitiatory sacrifice, that also means that we don't see the priests who lead the Eucharist and who consecrate it as sacrificial priests either. We don't see priests as being mediators between humanity and God, which was the medieval view. In the Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic Church primarily understood priests to be sacrificial ministers that appeased God on behalf of the people by offering up the sacrifice of the Mass. That idea is done away with. And after the Reformation, the main understanding of what a minister or an Anglican church, we still call them priests, what a priest is, is they are a teacher of God's word and a pastor. That's why in the BCP, the ordinal, that's the service for ordaining people to become priests, is almost entirely focused on the role of being a teacher, and there's no mention of the Eucharist explicitly. It does say that the priests will administer the sacraments, never actually specifically mentions the Eucharist. Incidentally, that's actually why the Roman Catholic Church in the 19th century said the Anglican Church has no valid orders in the sense that we don't have any priests, because our understanding of priesthood is very different to the Roman Catholic understanding. They believe the ordinal is not sufficient to make someone a priest in the Roman Catholic understanding because there was no explicit mention of the priest being a sacrificial minister. And of course, well, if they're going to say that a priest is a sacrificial minister, we're guilty as charged that we don't share that view. And so Anglican priests aren't uh, the exact same thing as a Roman Catholic priest in that sense. However, in the Anglican Church, we do believe that only a priest who has been ordained by a bishop can consecrate and lead the Eucharist. But the reasons for that are often misunderstood. And they're definitely different from the Roman Catholic understanding of that, so we're going to have to spend some time explaining it. In Roman Catholicism, the understanding is that unless someone has been ordained by a true bishop and has been given a spiritual gifting, they are not able to consecrate and transform bread and wine into the actual body and blood of Christ. So unless a true priest is presiding over the Eucharist, it's not the Eucharist. It's just bread and wine. There's no effect on the congregation. So there's this idea then that in the Eucharist, a spiritual almost miracle is taking place where bread and wine are transubstantiated into Christ's body and blood. And that can only happen if the minister who's consecrating the bread and wine has been properly gifted with a spiritual charism given to them by a bishop. That's not the Anglican understanding at all. Now, like Roman Catholics, Anglicans affirm the teachings of St. Ignatius of Antioch, who in the first century said in his letter to the Smyrnians, 
let that be deemed a proper Eucharist, which is administered either by the bishop or by one to whom he has entrusted it, that would be a priest. It is not lawful without the bishop to celebrate a love feast, but whatsoever he shall approve of, that is also pleasing to God, so that everything that is done may be secure and valid. So he says that unless a bishop is consecrating the Eucharist or one to whom he has entrusted the task, a Eucharist is not proper or valid. Now, what do we understand that to mean? In Roman Catholicism, that would basically mean that unless a priest is consecrating the Eucharist, it's not valid or proper in the sense that it's just not the Eucharist at all. It's just bread and wine. That's not what Anglicans believe. We understand this language of valid or proper to essentially mean lawful or appropriate. Now, how we understand that is that unless the church authorities have appointed someone to consecrate the Eucharist, the Eucharist has been performed in an illicit manner. Now, this is the same for almost all denominations of Christianity. Just think about it. What would happen if, let's say at your church, your congregation, whenever you take communion, your pastor, your lead pastor, is the person who presides over it? What would happen if one time the congregation all met together without the pastor, didn't tell the pastor about it, and decided to celebrate communion on their own. And they got someone else to lead it, someone who hadn't even been officially appointed by the church at all. Wouldn't that be a bit schismatic? It would sort of be going against the rules a bit. It would actually be a little bit rebellious. That's how the Anglicans understand it. In the Anglican church, we see bishops as the authorities who run the diocese. Bishops have a jurisdiction, they have responsibility over everything that happens in their diocese. Whenever the communion is being celebrated, we believe that that has to be led by someone whom the bishop, that's the chief authority, has appointed to that task. Otherwise, you are essentially being disobedient. That's why we say the Eucharist has to be celebrated by a priest. It has to be celebrated by someone whom the bishop has especially appointed to perform the task. Now, the key thing here is that also the person who a bishop is appointing to celebrate the Eucharist, that's a priest, is also someone the bishop has appointed to preach the word. Because we see the Eucharist as being very similar to the preaching of the word. In fact, in a sense, the Eucharist is preaching. It's preaching through a sacrament. It's preaching through the symbols of bread and wine and through the liturgy. The person who's being entrusted with that role of preaching God's promises to you through the Eucharist is also the person whom the bishop has appointed to preach the word to the congregation. If someone else was to get up and celebrate the Eucharist and lead it and consecrate it, who the bishop had never appointed, then we're going against our authorities. And as Romans 13 says, we need to be subject to our authorities. And since the Eucharist is a symbol and a representation of the unity of the church, it would go against the whole idea of the Eucharist for us to go against our authorities and do our own thing. That would break the unity of the church. We believe that unity is partially founded upon hierarchical structure. The unity of the body revolves around the fact that the body has different uses and roles. There's hands, there's feet, there's eyes, there's a nose, there's ears. They each have their particular task. We believe it would, to, it would go against the unity of the body if the nose starts doing the job of a hand, for instance. That's why we have a hierarchical structure where our authority, the bishop, appoints people to that task. So we're not having this idea that if a pre, if someone, a pastor who hasn't been ordained by an Anglican bishop celebrates the Eucharist, or they haven't taken the Eucharist. And what I mean by that is we're not saying that denominations like the Presbyterians or the Lutherans, who don't have bishops, don't have the Eucharist. That's not what we're saying. For those denominations, they have a different criteria of who their authorities are. They have a different hierarchical structure. And the Presbyterian Church a minister is appointed by the Presbyteriat, and we believe that's fine, okay? The Presbyteriat is your authority, it's your hierarchy, so the same rule applies. In the Presbyterian Church, only someone who's been ordained by the Presbyteriat can 
bleed and consecrate the Eucharist. We're not saying that's invalid. That is valid for them. If a Presbyterian minister were to become an Anglican, which happens all the time these days now that liturgy is in vogue, they would need to be reordained by a bishop. Why? Simply because now if they're going into an Anglican context, the bishop is our leader, and so we need to have our leader affirm that they have been appointed to this task. Okay, so the Anglican Church's view does not mean that denominations that don't have bishops or don't have a pastor that they happen to call a priest don't have the Eucharist. That's not at all what we're saying. Because the Eucharist is a celebration of the whole church, it's a celebration that the whole church abides in and participates in, it needs to be a celebration that embraces the whole breadth of the church, and that includes, of course, our bishops. If the celebration is happening without the bishop's approval and appointment, it's not including them in that celebration, and hence we say it's not proper or it's unlawful. Now, we can see this idea that we're not saying that other denominations that don't have bishops don't have the Eucharist in Article 23, which says, It is not lawful for any man to take upon him the office of public preaching or administering the sacraments in the congregation before he be lawfully called and sent to execute the same. And those who we ought to judge lawfully called and sent, which be chosen and called to this work by men who have public authority given unto them in the congregation to call and send ministers into the Lord's vineyard. So the, I, this this article has quite vague language. It never says the word bishop. It never says the word priest. The language is leaving ample room for other denominations like Presbyterians and Lutherans to still have a proper Eucharist, so long as the person who is leading the Eucharist has been properly called and sent. That's That's the only criteria. Someone has to be lawfully called and sent. Okay, and we're not saying the only way someone can be lawfully called and sent is if they're an Anglican bishop who's doing it. Now, there's one other reason why only someone who has been appointed by the proper authorities can celebrate the Eucharist, and that's that, as we're going to see in the next section, the Eucharist is a sacrament that signs and seals God's promises to us. The Eucharist needs to be something that we can have our trust put in. We need to be able to trust the promises the Eucharist is making. Now, if you just grabbed some some random old Joe off the streets and got him in, didn't even know if he was a Christian, and got him to lead to the Eucharist, in what possible sense could the Eucharist be signing and sealing God's very own promises to you for you to place your trust in? Why would anyone trust the word of some completely random guy off the block? That's why... Only someone who has been properly appointed by the church hierarchies can take the Eucharist. If the church authorities, and for Anglicans, that's the bishops, have said that this person has been properly evaluated and we have deemed them fit to preach and to administer the sacraments, here they are, they represent us, they represent the church. That means that we can affirm that the Eucharist that they are consecrating and leading does sign and seal God's promises. If it's someone who has not been tested, has not been properly ordered and appointed by the church authorities to do this very, very important task, it's sort of going against the whole idea of why the Eucharist signs and seals God's promises altogether. The church itself, the church is saying, this sacrament confirms that God has made a promise to you. If the church, which is represented by its hierarchies or bishops for Anglicans, has not actually appointed someone to lead the Eucharist, then the church is not really saying that this Eucharist can be trusted to seal God's promises. If the person leading the Eucharist can't even represent the church, then how can they possibly represent God? The next topic is that the Eucharist is a sacrament. It is one of the two sacraments that Anglicans affirm, the other one being baptism. Now, Article 25 and the homily on common prayer and sacraments teach us that the sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist are rituals or ceremonies that seal God's promises of salvation to us. In baptism, God confirms his promise of regeneration and adoption to those who have faith. Now, if you want to know more about that, by the way, check out my sermon on John 3 that I recently uploaded 
that goes into how baptism signs and seals God's promise of adoption and, and rebirth. Now, in the Eucharist, God confirms his promise of the forgiveness of our sins, our incorporation into the new covenant, and that Jesus will be our daily bread. In the homily on the worthy receiving of the sacrament, we read that in the Eucharist, the favorable mercies of God are sealed, the satisfaction by Christ towards us confirmed, the remission of sins established, so that we may feel the tranquility of conscience, the increase of faith, the strengthening of hope. In the Eucharistic liturgy of the BCP, the Eucharist is called a pledge of God's love. And in Thomas Cranmer's defense of the true doctrine, we read that, Whosoever eateth that bread in the supper of the Lord is assured of Christ's own promise and testament that he is a member of his body and receiveth the benefits of his passion. And then in a really beautiful paragraph, Thomas Cranmer says, As surely as we see the bread and wine of our eyes, and smell them with our noses, and touch them with our hands, and taste them with our mouths, so assuredly ought we to believe that Christ is our spiritual life and sustenance of our souls. So the Eucharist, by being so clearly perceptible to our senses, confirms the promise of our salvation if we only put our trust in the promises attached to it. When he instituted the Eucharist at the Last Supper, our Lord Jesus Christ said, This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for the forgiveness of your sins. So in the Eucharist, he seals and confirms his promise that we will have the forgiveness of our sins and that we will be incorporated into the new covenant. And if we simply trust in that promise, we will be saved. Faith is trust in God's promises, and those promises are being conveyed partially through the Eucharist. This is why Thomas Cranmer, in his defense, says that our faith must be grounded in the promises that are declared in Scripture and confirmed by the sacraments. When we open up our Bibles, Scripture makes promises to us, like in John 3.16, where it promises that if we believe in God's Son, we'll have eternal life. The Eucharist confirms that promise. Because just as we are eating the bread and drinking that wine, it's going into our bodies and we are perceiving them by our senses. God is confirming that, yes, that promise is applicable to you as an individual. You're not some random person who opened up a Bible and those promises maybe were meant for someone else. You're taking the Eucharist. You're taking it. That promise is given to you. And if you trust in that promise, you'll be saved. Because Anglicans believe in salvation by faith alone. Now, because baptism is a sacrament that signs and seals God's promise of rebirth, and we can only be born again once, baptism is only performed once in a person's life. Whereas the Eucharist signs and seals God's promises of the forgiveness of our sins, and the fact that Christ is our daily bread and the sustenance of our souls, that's why the Eucharist needs to be taken more frequently in our lives. Because as we live, we are going to continue to sin. Christ's promise of the forgiveness of our sins is continually true for us, even though we keep sinning. But of course, the fact that we keep sinning means that we do need to keep being reaffirmed of that promise. We need God to confirm that that promise is still holding up. He's still keeping his promise to us. And also, as we live, we need to have Jesus be our daily bread that's another reason why the Eucharist is regularly taken to regularly remind us that Christ is our daily bread. Now, the fact that the Eucharist is a sacrament leads us to the next topic, which is that the formularies refer to the Eucharist as being generally necessary for salvation. That's what the catechism that's found in the BCP says about the Eucharist, but it's often misunderstood. Hold on. If we're if Anglicans are saying we're saved by faith alone, why is the Eucharist generally necessary for salvation? That suggests that our salvation is now dependent on performing the Eucharist. So now it's probably better to say we're saved by faith and the Eucharist alone. But that's not what's going on. The homily of the worthy receiving of the sacrament says that in the Eucharist, the very bond of our conjunction with Christ is through faith wrought in the souls of the faithful, whereby not only their souls live to eternal life, but they surely trust to win to their bodies 
a resurrection to immortality. And it also calls the Eucharist the salve of immortality, a sovereign preservative against death, the pledge of eternal health, and the food of immortality. So the homily is clearly saying that the Eucharist is in some sense salvific, or at the very least involved in our salvation. But in what sense? It's simply that the Eucharist promises, it conveys God's promise of salvation. And therefore, by trusting in the promise that the Eucharist is declaring, we will be saved. Therefore, the Eucharist is instrumental in our salvation. Our salvation involves a lot of things. There's different ways that people talk about how the order of our salvation occurs. But let's just say for the sake of this video, let's talk about three things that are involved in our salvation. First of all, the work of Christ, the things that Christ did for us. Second, the promises of Christ's work. Three, our trust in those promises. Okay, so Jesus died on the cross. That's step one. Step two, God promises that his death on the cross saves us if we trust in it. Step three, we trust in the promises. The Eucharist is involved in the second part of that. The Eucharist is one of the means by which, it's one of the instruments by which God makes a promise to you about what his son Jesus did. And if you trust in that promise, you will be saved. That's why we say the Eucharist is salvific. It's because it conveys to you the grace that you receive by faith. The Eucharist is then generally, generally as in, in most cases, generally necessary for salvation because in most cases you should be, as a Christian, having God's promises signed and sealed to you in the sacraments. Without the sacraments signing, sealing God's promises, God's promises remain, in a sense, incomplete. That's not the fault of God, by the way. That's just saying that for us as creatures, his promise needs to be signed to us. That's And that's how we live our lives anyway. That's why we have contracts. That's why we have handshakes. That's why we have weddings. These things seal a promise to us. That's what the Eucharist is doing. As embodied creatures, we need physical seals of what we know is true. I know that my wife loves me, but she does, frankly, need to seal that love to me through affection, through hugs and kisses and those sorts of things. That's what sacraments are. They are sealing God's promises to us. And in most cases, that's why they're necessary for us. In most cases, our trust in God's promises needs to have something more tangible that is sealing them. And that's what the Eucharist does. Now, certainly, if we read Scripture and in Scripture see that God is making promises to us and we trust in those promises, yeah, yeah, we will be saved, absolutely. But hypothetically, if you bought a Bible, read it, understood that God is making promises to you, trusted those promises, and then didn't go to church ever, didn't take communion, didn't get baptized, obviously something's wrong. Obviously something's incomplete. You're not allowing God to sign and seal his pledges to you, which in scripture we can see God wants. Baptism is occurring throughout scripture. Jesus commands baptism. Jesus also commands that we take the Eucharist. He says, do this in remembrance of me. And in Acts, we see that the disciples met together to break bread. If we're reading the Bible, seeing God's promises, but also disobeying his commands and not allowing him to sign his promises to us, clearly something is not quite right. Okay, so scripture should be drawing us to the body of Christ, that is the church, where we can be baptized and take communion. But the Eucharist also signs and seals our commitment to Christ. In the Eucharist, we are affirming that there's nothing we can offer the Father that compares to what his Son offered. We're affirming that Christ is our daily bread. We're affirming that we want to abide in Christ. That's something that we are signing and sealing. If we're not taking the Eucharist, we're not conveying our commitment to do that in a tangible way. Same thing with weddings. That's why Christians continue to affirm that a couple needs to have a wedding ceremony because they need to publicly declare their commitment to each other. 
the same thing in the Eucharist. That's again why we'd say it's generally necessary for salvation. But of course, if you read the Bible and you believe its promises and you die that day, it doesn't mean you're not going to be saved at all. It just means that, okay, you didn't get to you didn't get to go to the commitment stage of things. Now, when we talk about the Eucharist and salvation, the key biblical text that will always come up is, of course, John 6. So let me read a passage from John 6 to you. This is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ talking. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread that the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. What's really important to understand about the Anglican view of the Eucharist is that we believe that we eat and drink Christ's flesh and blood perpetually by faith. It doesn't require the Eucharist for us to be eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Okay, so even when you're at home, you're not at church, you're not taking communion, through your faith and trust in Christ, you are feeding on his flesh and drinking his blood spiritually in your hearts. That will always be happening if you are a true elected believer. The Eucharist then signs and seals the reality of this feeding. But it's not the case that only in the Eucharist are we doing this. And therefore, when Jesus says, unless someone eats my flesh and drinks my blood, they have no life, that doesn't mean that if someone dies before they could eat his flesh and drink his blood, that they have no life and they can't be resurrected. Okay? We believe that all believers are doing that constantly. By feeding on his flesh and blood, that means that we are feeding on the fact that his flesh recreated our human nature. You can see more about that in my sermon on, about Midnight Mass that I've got linked to my in the description below. And also we're constantly drinking his blood in the sense that the blood he shed on the cross is constantly preserving our life. This is signed and sealed in the Eucharist. Now, this is a really crucial thing that Thomas Cramner makes very clear in his book on the defense of the true doctrine. He, he makes this really clear that all believers are perpetually feeding on Christ. Now, you might think, okay, well, that's just what Thomas Cramner believes. That's not necessarily in the formularies. And a lot of people think that the formularies are saying that the only way that we can eat Christ's flesh and drink his blood is in communion. That's actually not true. In the BCP, there is a liturgy for the communion of the sick. And in that liturgy, one of the rubrics says that if someone is too sick to take communion, the curate shall instruct him that if he do truly repent him of his sins and steadfastly believe that Jesus Christ hath suffered death upon the cross for him and shed his blood for his redemption, earnestly remembering the benefits he hath thereby, and giving him hearty thanks therefore, he doth eat and drink the body and blood of our Saviour Jesus Christ profitably to his soul's health, although he do not receive the sacrament of that with his mouth. There's an idea expressed very clearly then, simply by trusting in what Jesus Christ has done for us in his body and by the shedding of his blood, we perpetually feed on him, even if we aren't feeding on the sacrament of that with our mouths. So to wrap up this section then, when in the liturgy the priest administers the Eucharist to people and they say, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. The point is that Jesus Christ's body and blood preserve our souls to eternal life. But the bread and wine isn't the only way that that's happening. That is always happening to you by faith. The bread and wine are a sacrament of that reality. They are a pledge of that promise, but that is not the means by which the promise becomes applied to you. Here's a general rule for you in understanding Anglican sacramental theology, and in fact, all Protestant sacramental theology. Sacraments are not hoops that you have to jump through. They are gifts that God gives you so that you may have assurance. 
God instituted sacraments for assurance of salvation, not to restrict salvation. This is precisely the issue that the Protestant reformers had with the Roman Catholic Church. They believed, rightly so, that the Roman Catholic Church took what was meant to be a gift of assurance and turned it into something that restricts salvation. No longer does the Eucharist give you assurance that you are feeding on Christ, that you will be saved, that he did die for your sins. Now the Eucharist becomes a hoop you have to jump through in order for you to feed on Christ, for him to have died for you, for you to be saved. It completely subverts the entire idea of sacraments in our mind. Here's another rule. Our Lord Jesus Christ said that the that man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath for man. In the same way, man was not made for the sacraments, but sacraments for man. You have not been born so that you might take the Eucharist to be saved. The Eucharist was created so that it can give you assurance and, as the formularies say, tranquility of conscience, being assured of Christ's promises. So it's completely against the Anglican understanding and way of talking about the Eucharist for Anglicans to say to Presbyterians or Lutherans that maybe do things a little bit differently, oh, that you're not saved, you can't be saved anymore because you don't take the Eucharist like we do. It's completely undermined what Anglicans think about the Eucharist. The Eucharist gives us assurance. It doesn't make you saved. Okay, the last thing to talk about then is what Anglicans believe about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Anglicans affirm that. Anglicans believe that in the Eucharist, Christ is really present. His body and blood are truly present in the Eucharist, but not objectively in the bread and wine themselves, but in the hearts of those who receive the Eucharist. So first of all, Affirming the real presence, the Catechism in the BCP says, Christ's body and blood in the Eucharist are verily and indeed taken and received by the faithful. Okay, it is taken and received indeed, truly, by the faithful. There's a crucial aspect there, by the faithful. We're going to get to this later. If you're not a faithful Christian, you haven't received his body and blood. Therefore, it's not objectively in the bread and wine. So our understanding then is that in the Eucharist, the bread and wine remain bread and wine. They get they get transformed, so to speak, into symbols of Christ's body and blood. But there hasn't been a physical transformation or a substantial transformation. They remain bread and wine, but just for us, subjectively, they are symbols of Christ's body and blood, which is actually truly received in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. So the bread and wine do not stop being bread and wine and become Christ's body and blood like in Roman Catholicism under transubstantiation. They do not get merged with Christ's body and blood either. They just remain themselves. But when you take them and you believe in the promises attached to them, you receive Christ's body and blood in your heart spiritually by faith. Thomas Cranmer in his defense says, as they carnally eat with their mouth this sacramental bread and drink the wine, so spiritually they may eat and drink the flesh and blood of Christ. And this spiritual meat of Christ's body and blood is not received in the mouth or digested in the stomach, but is received with a pure heart and sincere faith. And the true eating and drinking of the said body and blood of Christ is with a constant and a lively faith to believe that Christ gave his body and shed his blood upon the cross for you. And therefore, of course, that means you're always eating and drinking his flesh and blood, even outside of the Eucharist. But in the Eucharist, that spiritual reality becomes signed and sealed and symbolized. He says that Christ is not in the bread and wine, but in them that worthily eat and drink the bread and wine. Now, this is also the teaching of John Jewell, another key Anglican divine, who in his treatise on the sacraments says, we say this meat is spiritual and therefore it must be eaten by faith and not with the mouth of our body. It goeth not into the mouth or belly, but into the soul and it feedeth the mind inwardly as the other outwardly feedeth the body. This is also what is clearly taught 
by the Anglican formularies. So in the homily on the worthy receiving of the sacrament, it says, The meat we seek for in the supper is spiritual food, the nourishment of our soul, a heavenly meal and not earthly, an invisible meat and not bodily, a ghostly substance and not carnal. We look up with faith upon the holy body and blood of God and touch it with the mind and receive it with the hand of the heart. So the body and blood of Christ aren't physically eaten or digested. It is spiritually and visibly received by the hand of the heart, as it beautifully says. This is also what we see in the 39 articles. Article 28 says, To such as rightly, worthily, and with faith receive the same, the bread which we break is a partaking of the body of Christ, and likewise the cup of blessing is a partaking of the blood of Christ. But the body of Christ is given, taken, and eaten in the supper only after an heavenly and spiritual manner. And the mean whereby the body of Christ is received and eaten in the Lord's Supper is faith. It is not actually physically eaten with your mouth and put in your stomach and then goes out to the toilet. You receive it invisibly and spiritually by faith. Of course, there it also says, to such as rightly worthy with faith receive the same. So we're going to now get to what Article 29 says, which is, the wicked and such as be void of a lively faith, Although they do carnally and visibly press with their teeth, as St. Augustine saith, the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ, yet in no wise are they partakers of Christ. The point here is that if someone eats the bread and drinks the wine in the Eucharist but doesn't have a true faith in Christ, they have just eaten bread and wine, and that's it. They have not actually received the body and blood of the Lord. They have, by the way, received the symbol, the symbol of his body, and blood. So it, they have actually disrespected the sacrament. Okay, so in 1 Corinthians, St. Paul says that if you take communion, if you if you eat the body and you're not mindful of the body, he says, if, if, you, if you're taking it in a wrong way, if you're not actually doing it with faith and with love for your brothers, then he says that you have eaten and drunk in judgment upon yourself, that you're guilty of Christ's body and blood. And that's why sometimes people get sick and die because they're taking communion without properly thinking about Christ, properly having faith in him, and also they're doing it in a disrespectful way to their brothers and sisters in Christ. That's because the bread and wine are symbols of Christ's body and blood. But the people who eat the bread and wine have not actually eaten Christ's body and blood. That can only happen to true believers. So if a little, little mouse, a little rat, breaks into the church and nibbles on the bread, they haven't eaten the body of Christ, okay? Point is, only those who have the Holy Spirit can receive the body and blood of Christ. Christ's body and blood is always present with his spirit. And if you don't have his spirit, it can't be present in you. It's present by means of Christ's Holy Spirit. And what that means is that we say that Christ's real presence is in the Eucharist subjectively, not objectively. Objectively would mean it's there no matter what. So even if a mosquito drinks out of the chalice, they've drunk Christ's blood. No, it's subjectively there, which means it's there for the subjects. It's there for those who worthily receive it with faith. Now, this view is also clearly seen in the BCP. So in the Eucharistic Liturgy, it says, All persons must diligently try and examine themselves before they presume to eat what they're eating of, that bread, and drink of that cup. Okay, so it's affirming that it's just bread and wine. For if with a true penitent heart and lively faith we receive that holy sacrament, then we spiritually eat the flesh of Christ and drink his blood. Going on, it says, Grant that we receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, so these are creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And then when the priest administers the bread to the congregation, he says, feed on him in thy heart with faith and thanksgiving. So it's very clear then that this view of the Eucharist is taught throughout the formularies and by the key Anglican divines. The bread and wine remain bread and wine, but become symbols of Christ's body and blood, which are received spiritually in the hearts of the faithful. However, this doesn't mean that the bread and wine can be disrespected. 
and thrown out and disregarded once the Eucharist is done, so the leftovers are put in the bin or fed to chickens. That's not also what we're saying either. The Eucharist is still to be treated with the utmost level of respect because the bread and wine have become symbols of Christ's body and blood, and that gives them real significance that you should not take lightly. So Thomas Cranmer, in his defense, says, We ought not unreverently and unadvisedly approach unto the meat of the Lord's table, as we do to other common meats and drinks, but with great fear and dread, lest we should come to that holy table unworthily, wherein is not only represented, but is also spiritually given to us, very Christ himself. Okay, so since the bread and wine represent Christ, but also because through the Eucharist that involves the bread and wine, we receive Christ. You cannot disrespect this and treat it just like some old meal. Now, this view of what we call the spiritual real presence, and sometimes people call it receptionism, and I'm not going to debate over exactly what phrase to give it. Whatever we call it, it is found in the church fathers. So, for instance, St. Ambrose in his book on the mysteries says, and that sacrament is Christ, because it is the body of Christ. It is therefore not bodily food, but spiritual. Whence the apostle says of its type, our fathers ate spiritual food and drank spiritual drink, for the body of God is a spiritual body. And St. Augustine, in his tractates on John's gospel, says, Why preparest thou thy teeth and belly? Believe, and thou hast eaten. We eateth inwardly, not outwardly. We eateth in the heart, not presseth with the teeth. He says that in interpreting what Jesus says in John 6. So the point is, Augustine doesn't believe that you physically eat Christ, that the body of Christ is received in the mouth. He believes, as we do, that he is received perpetually through faith. Now, why do Anglicans believe this? Why do we think that it is important to make the distinction that we are only spiritually and invisibly receiving Christ? Well, in the BCP, at the end of the Eucharistic liturgy, there is a rubric or an instruction. This is what is infamously called the black rubric, and here's what it says. It is here declared that no adoration is intended or ought to be done, either unto the sacramental bread and wine there bodily received, or unto any corporal or physical presence of Christ's natural flesh and blood. So Christ is not actually corporally or physically present. For the sacramental bread and wine remain still in their very natural substances that rules at transubstantiation. The substance of bread and wine remain in the bread and wine. It's in, in Roman Catholicism only, the accidents remain, the substance of bread and wine have been transformed into the substance of Christ's body and blood. That's ruled out by this rubric. Okay, so the bread and wine remain still in their very natural substances and therefore may not be adored. Again, that's what Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox do. They worship and adore the sacrament, even the reserved sacrament that they have in church. People bow before it, they prostrate themselves before it, they cross themselves before it, they pray to it. It's not what we're saying is appropriate. It says here that that is uh, idolatry, to be abhorred of all faithful Christians. Why? Here we go. And the natural body and blood of our Savior Christ are in heaven and not here, it being against the truth of Christ's natural body to be at one time in more places than one. The point is, is that because Jesus is fully human, his human nature is like ours. Of course, it has been glorified, so it's immortal and such things. But creatures, one of the crucial aspects of what makes someone a creature is that they are embodied that they have a body that has limits. I only exist in this space. I'm not everywhere. That would make me God. Jesus, of course, is God. However, Jesus also has a created human nature, and his human nature has not been mingled or merged or confused with his divine nature. It has been united to his divine nature in his person. The person of the Son of God has divine nature, and he has united a human nature to it, but it has not been merged together. That is neophysitism, and we believe that is a heresy. We, as faithful Orthodox Christians, are diophysites. 
That is two natures that have not been mingled, but have been united. This means that Christ's human nature remains a human creaturely nature. He can only be in one place at one time. If he were to be everywhere at once in his human nature, that would be to confuse his humanity with his divinity. Therefore, since he is, has a human nature, his human body is only in one place. Currently, that is at the right hand of God in heaven, as the Bible constantly affirms that Jesus is now at the right hand. Even the Apostles' Creed says that, that Jesus ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of of God the Father. He isn't everywhere. Jesus Christ's human nature is not here with me now. He is with me by his Holy Spirit. He is with me in the sense that he is the Logos, the eternal Son of God, who is holding all things in this room and in this entire universe together, okay? But not his human nature. That's why we don't think that he can be physically present in the Eucharist, because he can only be physically present in one place at one time. Now, this idea we find also in the Church Fathers. That's why men like Thomas Cromner believed it in the first place. So St. Augustine says, Our Lord Jesus Christ is everywhere as God, and as man he is in a certain place in heaven, because of the measure of having a true body. And St. Cyril of Alexandria, the key church father for defining what is an orthodox opinion about Christ's divinity and humanity and such things, he says, Although Christ took away from hence the presence of his body, yet in the majesty of his Godhead he is ever here. So so St. Cyril, the key guy about Jesus Christ's hypostatic union, is saying that as God, he's everywhere, in the presence of his body, as man, he's in one place. This is not a heresy. This is classic Christianity. To say that Christ is everywhere as human is to confuse his humanity with his divinity. It's the same thing as saying, on the cross, Jesus died. Yep. The Son of God died. Yes. God died. Yes. But God, the Son of God, Jesus, did not die in his divine nature. His divinity can't die. That would be to completely go against divinity. He died in his human nature. His human nature died, not his divine nature. Because his human nature has been united to him hypostatically, since his human nature is the nature of his person, we can therefore say the Son of God died or Jesus died, okay? Because it's part of his person. But his divine nature didn't. It's the same thing in the Eucharist. We can say that Jesus is present with us divinely by his Holy Spirit, but not in his actual body and blood. Okay? Now, the reason why we say that we can feed on Christ spiritually in our hearts is because we believe that in the Eucharist, we are being exalted into the heavenly realm and feeding on Christ at the right hand of God the Father. That's why in the liturgy we say, lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord, That's why in the liturgy we affirm that we are celebrating alongside angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. We've been exalted into the heavenly realm. But crucially, that's something that happens to us all the time as Christians, not just in the Eucharist. As we see in Ephesians 1, we have been seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We are united to Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of Father Christians live in heaven and on earth, and that's why we're always feeding on Christ at the right hand of God the Father, not only in the Eucharist. But in the Eucharist, this invisible reality becomes sacramentally represented to us. All this, by the way, is in keeping with the Athanasian Creed, which says that Christ's incarnation is not a conversion of Godhead into flesh, it's to bring God down, but is an exaltation of humanity up to God. We are being brought up to God not God being brought down to us. So God is not being converted into bread and wine, but rather bread and wine is taking us up with him into heaven where we receive him there. And while I said that we are always in the heavenly realm, the bread and wine stir up our hearts to believe and trust in that reality. In conclusion, Anglicans believe that receiving and abiding in the body and blood of Jesus Christ forgives and cleanses us of our sins and gives us eternal life. But we believe that by faith, 
God's chosen people eternally and continuously feed on Christ and abide in him. And so we are eternally and continuously justified. Our justification cannot be lost and regained, it cannot be increased or decreased. It is continual because by faith we continually feed on Christ because our faith is a gift that God will preserve in us until the very end for those who he has elected to eternal life. The Eucharist then signs, symbolizes, seals, confirms, and pledges this reality and this promise to us. The Eucharist is then also the means by which this reality can become effected. Because when the Eucharist promises us that Christ can be our food for salvation, when we believe and trust in that promise, it becomes real for us. We appropriate it by faith. Faith is the means by which we take God's promise and appropriate it to us. Jesus did the work for us. Faith is how we receive the benefits of that work. The Eucharist is one of the means by which Christ's work is promised to us. When the priest offers the Eucharist, he is offering you the promise of your salvation, and by faith you receive that promise and it becomes true. The Eucharist can therefore be a means by which people can be saved if, if that's for instance, the first time they've really realized that promise and appropriate it for themselves, but also stirs up our hearts to continually have assurance in that promise and to keep on trusting in it. Okay, well, I hope you have found that video helpful. I hope it's been informative. I hope it has enriched your life. And please like this video, subscribe to this channel and all that sort of thing. If you want to learn more about Anglicanism, check out some of my other videos. I hope you have a great day and God bless you.